a professor of political science at Tulane University. She is the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Project on Gender, Race, and Politics in the South. Before joining the faculty of Tulane, she taught at the University of Chicago and Princeton University. She is the author of two highly acclaimed books, including Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, which, which won awards in 2005 from the National Conference of Black Political Scientists and the American Political Science Association. In 2011, Professor Harris Perry authored Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America, which examines the impact of stereotypes on black women's politics. A political expert and columnist for the nation, she is also the host of her own weekend show on MSNBC, where she is redefining in the best possible way what it means to be a nerd. <laughs> Behind me, we have flags representing the 53 countries where our students come from. But in preparing for Professor Harris Perry's arrival to campus today, we noticed that one flag was missing. And that is the flag of Nerdland. <laughs> Professor Harris Perry, we embrace your concept of a space dedicated to the open intellectual exchange of ideas and views. And we are delighted to welcome you to Wellesley. And I have something to present to you. the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> I, um, I, I often say that um, the very best day of my life was college graduation. And I've had two really very nice weddings. Um, uh, and, I, and I have a wonderful daughter and the day she was born was lovely, but really the... <laughs> But all of those days were complicated with all of these other sorts of things. And so I've always said, you know, it was really the, the one day that was pure joy was the day I graduated from college. You should also know I'm a high, I am in fact a high school dropout. I do not have a, a GED or a high school diploma. So it's also the day when I, it was clear that I was not going to have to go back to Central Virginia to high school. <laughs> but I think after that moment, it is possible now that your college graduation day is my favorite day. <laughs> Good morning. I do, in fact, bring greetings from apparently only the New York branch of Nerdland. <laughs> My producers are um, incredibly excited to have you all as part of our big community. Apparently, the Nielsen ratings tell us that everyone who watches our show is over 70. And so it is really quite lovely to see that that must be em empirically false, because here you are. Now that said, if you've been following me on Twitter, then you know that despite the fact, <laughs> you know that despite the fact that I actually make my living doing public speaking, I have been nervous about this morning. And I'm nervous because this is a commencement address. Uh, when I'm in class, my, my work is about leading students through complicated readings, or it's about explaining texts or working through difficult concepts. When I'm on television, I do storytelling and analysis and sometimes a little reacting. <laughs> and I could do all of those things right here, but it does feel like a commencement address somehow ought to impart wisdom. It ought to give advice. And the fact is, I am very bad at giving advice. <laughs> now, I guess what I, really, what I really mean is I'm bad at giving advice in mass. If we were girls, if y'all were my people, and we were just sitting together talking about something, I would probably give you way too much advice. But the fact is that I don't know 
what is about to happen for you. Some of you are going to become fabulously wealthy <laughs> through hard work or inheritance <laughs> or marriage or divorce. <laughs> Some of you will be barely scraping by paycheck to paycheck. through hard work, or inheritance, or marriage, or divorce. Some of you are going to love your work, and you are going to wake up each day as though you are answering a calling. And others of you are going to beat the crap out of your alarm clock because it is telling you that there is another work day. Some of you will marry the right man the first time, and for some of you it will take until your second marriage to marry the right woman. And plenty, plenty, plenty of you will embrace the delightful pleasures of both solitude and partnership without state interference. Some of you are going to return to your 20th reunion with sour-faced teenagers in tow, and others will still be chasing toddlers. Some of you will return as men. Some of you are going to enjoy robust health into your 80s, and some of you are going to succumb to illness and tragedy long before we're ready to lose you. So I don't know how to give you advice, because I don't know which one of you will be walking on which paths. And it's such a complicated territory. So I thought, OK, I'm going to outsource the advice giving. And my first sense was that I would synthesize the advice of famous and important thinkers who have told us how to be successful. So I started, of course, being a Unitarian Universalist from the crib with Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American transcendentalist. And this is a pretty good definition of advice, to laugh often and much to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty and to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. That's nice. That's pretty, right? You could put that on your wall. The fact is I am a, a bit partial, though, to another take on success, this one by the hard-drinking, misanthropic W.C. Fields, who says, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, then give up. No use in being a damn fool about it. <laughs> there is a world full of great quotes, but no matter how much I try to create them into an outsourced advice lecture for you, none of them felt quite right. So I thought, I know, I'll do a children's book theme. I know if you've read The Velveteen Principles, then you know that everything that you need to know about how to have an authentic, successful life is actually conveyed in the book The Velveteen Rabbit. I thought, I'll do a little riff on Mo Williams' The Pigeon Principles. You guys know the pigeon books, right? Don't let the pigeon stay up late. Don't let the pigeon drive the bus. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a 10-year-old. This is whatever. <laughs> At first glance, the pigeon is selfish and whiny, manipulative. But if we read the pigeon with love, we will see that the pigeon actually gives us clues about how to be persuasive, kind, adventurous, and assertive. It would have been a great speech. I was going to tell you how to look at your own sometimes whiny, narcissistic self with love and actually <laughs> find your best selves underneath all that fragility. But it occurred to me it might annoy your parents <laughs> if they discovered after four years of very expensive college education that everything you needed to know to succeed you'd already read in the second grade. <laughs> Now, I do have to say, thank God, that Kate and Haley said Beyonce before I did. <laughs> it is an indication that you are truly a part of Nerdland if you too love Beyonce. <laughs> Beyonce. Okay, so after I'd gotten through the great men advice and the pigeon parables, I thought, how about hip hop? 
I mean, who better to give advice to young graduates going off into recession-era America than rappers? <laughs> We've got KRS-One asking, who gets weaker, the king or the teacher? It's not about salary, it's about reality. It's good, right? It's a nice message, like, you know, pick the thing you love that makes a difference, not self-importance. We've got the roots, right? They work, they work good. So yeah, yeah, right? And in their track, Thoughts at work, they say, F getting money for real, get freedom, right? It's a good message, right? Right? Follow your passion, don't follow the money. And then, I, of course, I got to the most important piece of hip hop advice ever dispensed by that prophet, the notorious B.I.G. <laughs> Never get high on your own supply. I decided maybe the hip-hop lecture was ill-advised. So <laughs> then I decided, that's right, Wellesley is a women's college. And sometimes there is advice specifically for girls, working girls entering out into the working world as working girls. So I thought I could just tell you a bit about some things I've learned as a working girl. Here's one of them. Don't nod and smile unless you are happy and agree. Don't let your voice do that high pitch thing at the end that sounds like you're asking a question when really you're making a statement. <laughs> Once you have secured your Wellesley degree, and particularly if you follow it up with an Ivy League law degree, never forsake your high profile career path and advocacy to follow some dude to the God forsaken region of the American South like Arkansas. Whoops. <laughs> See how the girl advice doesn't always work out? Like, in fact, sometimes it can be quite powerful to nod and smile just before you punch him in the neck. And sometimes a little question at the end of your declarative statement is a worthwhile way to get some of the old guys who run all the money thing on your side. And sometimes you follow your heart and you go with the big tall guy down to Arkansas and it all works out <laughs> just fine. So I decided that the girl advice was no good. And in the end, I was left with having to do what I didn't want to do, which is I've just got to give you the best advice I've got. I've got three things I want to ask you to be as you move forward. And I think these might be a little bit counterintuitive, particularly coming from a political progressive who is unashamedly feminist, concerned with, <laughs> concerned with racial and economic and environmental justice. But here are the... Here are the three things I'm gonna ask of you. Be ignorant, be silent, and be thick. Now, I could do the little, if Shanta was here, she's one of my producers, I'd do that. You didn't think I was gonna say that, huh? Right, okay. <laughs> be ignorant, be silent, and be thick. Okay, in a few moments you're gonna walk across the stage and you're going to have your accomplishments acknowledged in the acquisition of a certification that you know something. But even as you accept your hard-won degree, I encourage you to embrace the reality that you know almost nothing. I love my iPad. I'm reading my lecture right now from my iPad. I, I love that it streams books and knowledge and information to me matrix-like at a moment, like whoosh, anything I need to know. But it is important for me to pretty regularly just go and stand in the library. It is an awful experience standing in a library. I think of myself as quite accomplished. I've written two books. <laughs> <laughs> but when you stand in the library and you are surrounded by those stacks of all of those thousands of volumes of texts of things that you know nothing about, written in languages that you cannot decipher, on topics that you can barely fathom. It is humbling. Standing in a library reminds us of our own limitations. It encourages us to remember that we don't know everything, can't predict every outcome, don't even know all the right questions to ask. I will never fill a cavity it is pretty unlikely that I will ever speak Mandarin. 
I am certainly not going to decode anything in the DNA chain. But thankfully, graciously, the universe provides an interdependent web of other fantastic women who will. <laughs> Remembering our ignorance, embracing our ignorance, allowing ourselves to accept a posture of ignorance compels us to keep learning. There's gonna come a September morning very soon when you are going to miss this place. And not just the buildings and not just your friends, you are going to miss a new syllabus. You're gonna miss somebody handing you a piece of paper full of things that you've not thought about yet, about challenges you didn't even know existed. The exquisite moment of utter ignorance just before the learning begins. I promise you, you will miss it. So remember, ignorance is not your enemy. Only complacency with ignorance is to be resisted. Never become so enamored of your own smarts that you stop signing up for life's hard classes. Remember to keep forming hypotheses and gathering data. Keep your conclusions light and your curiosity ferocious. Keep groping in the darkness with ravenous desire. Ignorance is not incompatible with excellence. It is not incompatible with leadership. It is not incompatible with greatness. Ignorance is a posture of humility. Which brings me to another piece of non-traditional advice. Be silent. Now if the Nerdland staff is watching right now, they probably just fell out of their chairs. <laughs> because I know that they didn't even know I could be silent as long as I just was. And in fact, not just the Nerdland staff, but we share space in 30 Rock right next to the UP staff. And the UP staff is actually quite diligent. They're, they're very quiet, they type along. And when I come in, usually on Thursdays or Fridays, the screaming begins. I sit in my office where I don't much like to be alone and I scream, oh my God, have you read the script in A4? Come in here, talk to me, come, come. But sometimes they just shut the door. I am, in being a feminist and having been trained as a feminist, very good at using my voice. Women's education is very much about finding your voice, about learning to speak, about speaking with confidence, about sharing your ideas freely, about battling the boys. But there is an enormous difference between being silenced and choosing to be silent. When you are silenced, you have something to say, but, but no one will listen. When you choose to be silent, to quiet it down, to listen. You've actually exercised the other part of voice, the part that makes your voice sound like something. It sounds like something in comparison to the silence. Silence can help to soothe one of the voices that you actually would like to be more quiet more frequently. It's what Jay Smooth would call your internal hater, your little hater. I don't know if boys have the hater, girls have the hater. The hater sits on our shoulder and tells us, sit up straight. Oh my God, you have a list, why are you talking? <laughs> the little hater fusses at us and tells us that we are insufficient. It suggests that we can't do math because it's hard. She is actually soothed by silence. You can actually encourage that part of your meta-narrative voice to be quiet so that this part of your voice can speak. And silence allows you to do something else that you now have as Wellesley women. You have privilege. No matter what circumstances of disprivilege you came from, this degree now confers upon you privilege. And when you choose to be silent in the face of those who have less privilege, you undermine the idea that only people with certain degrees and certain certifications have a right to speak. So, I'm not asking you to silence your advocacy for justice or to mute your voice as a citizen. I'm not asking you to accept the opinions of others as your own truths. I'm not asking you to sit on your ideas or fail to share your skills. I'm asking you to remember that silence is a vital precursor to voice. Gather your voice in your silence. Listen to it in your own head before you give it away. Wake up, roll over, and make love to the day worldlessly. And my final piece of advice is this be thick. In a world that teaches women to be thin, 
be thick. Recall the moment in Toni Morrison's Beloved when Paul D. says to Setha, your love is too thick, Setha. And she responds, love is or it isn't. Then love ain't no love at all. Thick is the only thing worth being. When you are thick, you unconditionally embrace the object of your attention. Thick women make fools of themselves all the time. Because thin women stand on the sidelines. They're critical, they're removed, they're barely committed. But thick people pitch tents in a park with the belief that social action can change an entire international global system of economic injustice. Thin, thin citizens vote, thick citizens run for office. Thin folks believe that every critic is a hater. Thick folks can hear critique without crumbling. Thin leaders stay the course no matter what. Thick leaders listen, learn, and correct. Thin women look great in bikinis. Thick women look terrific in history books. <laughs> Cultivate a radical thickness that allows you to be vulnerable and imperfect and to cast yourself headlong into the crazy, scary, painful, grown-up world. Which brings me to the end. Be ignorant and silent and thick, but don't do it alone. You cannot be brave all by yourself. Everybody's got to have a Charlotte. You know Charlotte's Web. <laughs> You're going to be Wilbur a lot. You know, the, the naive little pig who learns of his own impending demise, his future as bacon. <laughs> and remember Charlotte, the, the little spider, who did more than just craft and execute a plan for Wilbur. She was his friend. You will be Wilbur over and over, and you're going to need a Charlotte. Now, when Wilbur first met Charlotte, Wilbur was not sure. Wilbur thought to himself, I've got a new friend, all right, but what a gamble friendship is. Charlotte is fierce, brutal, scheming, bloodthirsty, everything I don't like. How can I learn to like her? Even though she is pretty and, of course, clever. Your Charlotte is probably not packaged neatly. Your Charlotte is probably a little scheming and bloodthirsty. She probably never nods and smiles or says declarative statements like a question. She probably watches Nerdland. <laughs> but find your Char Charlotte. You're going to need a soulmate. You're going to need the courage. You're going to need somebody to write in their web. No, really, you are some pig. <laughs> but more than anything else, all the advice I gave you from hip hop, from children's books, from the great men, and even my notion of ignorant, silent thickness. Let it all go if it's not right for you. Just throw it all away. Because this is the start of your day. Thank you. <laughs>